Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Pro, we have a good one today. I've been excited about this for a long time. I'm telling you, this guy has stuff that's going to revolutionize medicine, I think, and, and um, what we're doing for sure. Like he's been I mean, doing I, a lot I, of work down, you know, behind the scenes. So, Tro, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. I've, I've been following this guy for a bit on Twitter and I've seen uh, some amazing imaging studies just uh, with with you know, with reversal of, of vascular issues that have just, you know, really opened up my eyes. I've seen some interesting data on visceral fat, and I'm really, really happy to finally have the man, the good doctor and lawyer on today. So yeah, I'm very excited, Brian. Yeah, Dr. Sean O'Meara, welcome, welcome. Tell people what you're doing and, and uh, how you're going to help us out with medicine to figure out these difficult patients. Sure, sir. So uh, I'm uh, formally trained as an emergency medicine doctor, but uh, like a few of us now in this space, I get involved in the low carb uh, dietary movement and uh, got interested in, in going paleo probably about 12 years ago and uh, then made the shift to keto and now most recently carnivore in the past three years. So uh, I noticed within one year of going low carb that all my then existing medical conditions had completely reversed. So I went from a, hosp a, a hospital-based physician working in the ER, drinking a gallon of skim milk with chocolate powder, uh, walking around the ER thinking that I was uh, being healthy that way and was going to lose weight, uh, to uh, abandoning carbohydrates and losing all of the then medical conditions I had. I had uh, very bad reflux, acid reflux. I had uh, clogged arteries, uh, carotid uh, uh, arteries that were, were clogged. I had I was pre-diabetic. I was overweight. I uh, had an enlarged prostate that was getting me up three times or sometimes four times a night. And uh, I had restless leg syndrome and I had obstructive sleep apnea. And within one year of going on that, going on a low carb paleo diet, that all completely went away. And I was just the only way to describe it was just pissed off. I mean, I felt like a fraud and I thought like my medical degree and education was fraudulent because uh, I was taking all the medicines, doing all the right things that we learned in medical school and none of it was really working. It was just a dietary change. So that's how I got introduced into um, nutrition and living an optimal health style and uh, lifestyle. And then I've just taken off from there, uh, got super passionate about it and joined a medical practice that was uh, a research and a medical practice, mostly doing research. And we began looking at visceral fat using an MRI to track visceral fat. That was back in 2014. And we continued to study visceral fat and other biomarkers that we learned and eventually applied for a, a grant based on our clinical results reversing chronic disease that we were documenting on this MRI. And uh, we applied for a National Science Foundation grant, received that, and continued uh, providing us funding for another four to five years that we conducted research. And it was just super cool because we could look at, you know, the differences between what happens when somebody runs versus what happens when somebody sprints and track visceral fat, muscle to fat ratios and uh, pericardial fat and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease disease within the, the cerebral arteries. So we learned an awful lot about making those disease processes better and eventually getting, getting rid of them all together and tracking it to clin clinical symptomatology as well. So uh, I have about uh, you know, 10 to 12 years worth of uh, research experience now uh, in this particular space and uh, just am as passionate as can be about trying to get people now uh, as healthy as possible. You know, I, I, I'm just curious. So, you know, can you walk me through like your career? So, so you, you mentioned you started, I want to just understand the person a little bit and then understand like, what was the, the point where you said, okay, let me try something different. Let me try something new. Let me, 
you know, because now I know you, you deal a lot with performance and getting people their, their health better. And you're, you're tracking these things. I mean, how do you go from being a lawyer to an emergency room doc to like optimizing people's health through nutrition? Because I just want to understand. And then at what point did the light bulb switch and say, what the hell, like, why, you know, why is our practice, you know, why is medicine so backwards? You know, when did that, when did that switch happen? Yeah. So the, the switch happened. I've always been kind of a, you know, a guy that had a lot of interest in doing a lot of things. I was in law enforcement, was a cop before I went to, uh, uh, and I did undercover drug work. I was a narcotics agent and uh, then went to, to law school and practiced as a criminal prosecutor for three years. So I was used to trying out new things. I mean, I, I liked doing uh, interesting things and living life well, but, you know, I was just getting increasingly uh, less healthy and more diseased. And uh, it was just one patient that appeared in front of me. He was this super healthy guy. And uh, I, I asked him why he was so healthy. And he had this kind of glow about him. His skin looked um, really healthy. And, and uh, so uh, I, uh, I asked him about his diet, if he eats a certain diet or eats a certain way. And he told me he went paleo. And I, I never heard of paleo. But I'll tell an, you know, an interesting tidbit why paleo intrigued me, even though I never heard of it. He said that Sergey Brin, you know, the owner and founder of Google, went paleo because uh, they had been studying, Google had been studying the paleo diet, and they found that compared to all other diets, that paleo uh, attracted more interest in terms of online reading than any other diet. You know, uh, Jenny Craig, Nutrisystems, Metafast. Uh, Atkins, Mediterranean, nobody read as much on those other diets as they did paleo, being low carb and high fat. So Google knew that that was important. And things that don't work aren't important, but things that do in an important area like health, they realized that that was a validating online metric to support a low carb, high fat existence for human beings. And the second thing that Google saw, and they was that people endorsed it. They, they, their family and friends of those people who were spending all that time reading about low carb, high fat paleo were doing the same thing. So it didn't happen with the other diets. So those two factors led Sergey Brin to go paleo, low carb, high fat. And uh, I, I instantly, I saw that. I'm like, well, that works. I mean, if, if compared to, I was intensely data driven and I immediately went paleo and I sent it, I sent this strange diet to all my colleagues, all my physician friends from medical school. And I was shocked that none of them, none of them went low carb, high fat. In fact, my, you know, my best friend, we were best friends and, 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 and weddings, you know, to each other. And uh, he, he wouldn't go low carb, high fat for 10 years. It took him, <laughs> but uh, I saw it right away. And it was, it was basically, you know, the data insight, how humans were responding and behaving around that diet. And then my own uh, adaptation of it, and which allowed all of those uh, symptoms that I was suffering from, just like everybody else, doctors have as many, you know, conditions as their, their patients uh, only mine went away. And so and more I, and more, right? The doctors, okay. you know, and more, especially suicide. Brian's talked a lot about that, right? You yeah, know, we have yeah. more, we have more of certain conditions. Yeah. So chronic disease continues to worsen. And uh, you know, in my opinion, I like to make this point. Um, I like to challenge the audience listen right now, identify a bigger problem than chronic disease in our country and the world. I can't see one. The biggest problem is chronic disease. And the reason why I look at metrics, money and lives. No problem costs more money than chronic disease in terms of the degrading of productivity, the loss of performance in people's lives, the amount of money spent treating the disease, not making it go away, and the um, loss of lives, the number of people it kills, and the loss of impairment, the quality of life. That's a big, big freaking problem. So I think that's that's why I am personally so passionate about trying to solve this problem and make, you know, have some contributions, a contributory role in trying to get our country, first of all, more aware of the biggest problem that we have, chronic disease. And that the tragedy of it all is, as you know, 
is completely preventable. It's completely reversible. We can prevent and reverse chronic disease, but we're part of a system. Both of you uh, physicians start out in the same system I did, conventional healthcare. And it unfortunately encourages and incentivizes a treatment model uh, that financially rewards the whole system. It's not just us foot soldier physicians, you know, right from the first encounter with patients all throughout, but the entire system is skimming money off of and is incentivized by the propagation of disease. I mean, what is going to happen to the conventional health system if everyone gets healthy? It's going to collapse. So I'll just make the prediction. Jeff Bezos, somebody's going to get to him or another very bright, forward-thinking, early adopter and say, you can disrupt healthcare by looking at the right things to reverse disease instead of continuing it and making profit. Change the metrics, and we're going to disrupt healthcare, conventional healthcare, and you'll see clinics, doctor's offices, hospitals, financial systems and institutions shutting down and it will completely disrupt and transform healthcare in the same way Amazon disrupted retail, brick and mortar uh, retail business. We're going to be able to do the same thing. So it's, it's, it's disruption in the making, I think, uh, that we're gonna see probably, I hope within the next decade uh, from bright engineers that are gonna look at uh, the right things to study and I don't even think it has to be done by physicians. I think health coaches can do this because you and I probably, we see that the most impact in people's lives is, is not from medicine, it's from lifestyle changes. So I think that's what disruption is gonna happen is, is giving people the proper metrics, the, the necessary lifestyle changes, the strategies to, to reverse disease and to optimize their health and, and so uh, optimize their, their life. So I'm super excited about the future. Yeah, that clip should be played at every medical school, right? Doctors should hear this, young docs. You know, we're seeing some young docs coming up who get it and they understand the problem is, for, from our standpoint, it's a uh, bottom-up approach, right? Because we're trying to get the patients convinced. And when we have results, which we're having, and we send them back to the big healthcare system where, you know, I have... 90 patients now that are from a big healthcare system here. Um, and when they go back and lose 48 pounds and come off all their meds, the doctor doesn't say, what the heck did you do? Like I would be concerned about cancer or diabetes out of control. When someone loses 48 pounds and comes off all their meds, I think something's wrong, right? And you want to figure it out. No curiosity. It's a sad statement about our, our current state of affairs, right? Because that doctor only has six or eight minutes with that patient and they're not going to get into a long discussion about what they did, but they're healthier patients off their meds. Yeah, well, I think one of the challenges that I'm interested in what you guys are doing is I think we, as physicians that have, you know, grasped the insights to uh, living healthy and the benefit that uh, patients, and uh, you know, I, I think we ought to stop calling the patients consumers. You know, our consumers experience when they adopt the healthy lifestyle. It's, it's going to be uh, important for us early on physicians to, to figure out platforms that we can um, develop compensation and make money off this. Because unless you provide some sort of, of profit uh, motive, some sort of successful commercial venture attached to improving people's lifestyles, it's not going to work. I mean, it's not going to be sustained. It's not going to propagate. And that, that was the one condition that we failed, my research partner and I failed, in with the National Science Foundation, we would have gone on and got additional funding. But, you know, the whole world is filled with bright ideas. A lot of scientists figure out things. The easy part was reversing chronic disease, the science we got. You know where we failed? We couldn't figure out how to make money off this thing that got people healthier. I, we couldn't figure it out. I mean, we were terrible business guys. And we were great researchers. We knew, you know, what, what we had to do to get rid of that disease. But how do you charge people? How do you get people? Do you do a subscription base? And the other thing is a lot of people don't want to pay for health. They just got in the habit of their insurance companies paying for it. And then that's a whole other, you know, ball of wax. So, you know, I think you got to get clients. You got to get consumers to understand that, hey, you're offering something different. It's not going to be through the conventional insurance space. They're going to have to pay for it. 
but it's going to be way better than what they're getting from uh, the insurance industry. So, you know, direct primary care and these other models that are starting to emerge within the, the practice of medicine, I think are beneficial because they're providing alternative strategies, commercial strategies for physicians that are doing great work to be compensated so that it can be encouraged because what do you tell those young doctors when we, like you said, go and you know play these clips in medical school? How are they going to make money off of this to be able to earn a gainful living? And so uh, I think that's that's part of the importance of, uh, of the development and, and uh, necessary strategies ahead to help propagate this across the country uh, is to to help physicians make that transition successfully and financially. I, you know, I don't I don't have to make the money I was making in the ER. In fact. You know, as I get more healthy, I'm less less uh, less needing of money. I'm more I get more satisfaction just going out and walking and, and being in nature than you know driving uh, driving some fancy car, living in some fancy house. But this is my way, and I'd be living in a teepee if I could just talk my wife into it. <laughs> yeah, man, I, we should I, have I, gospel music throw in the background with this. This is like preaching to the choir here. Look, absolutely, everything you're saying, I absolutely agree with. Here's the here's the issues, right? Um, one, I think this is the problem with modern medicine, okay? The modern doctor, okay, gets paid by an insurance company and they get paid a set amount, which means that they're gonna try to rush patients in a smaller and smaller amount of time, okay? Um, that's, that's one of the problems. We're beholden to the insurance companies instead of beholden to the patient, right? The patient, if we were more concerned about, is our patient doing well? Can I keep them well? Have they got on their scale? Have they used their CGM? Are they using their breath meter, right? If we were watching things, right, and actually cared about their outcome, meaning are they losing weight? Are they maintaining the weight off, right? Me and, uh, you know, are they using a keto mojo, you know, uh, uh, ketone meter? And did they check, you know, a couple times this year? And do we know that they're in low level ketosis or not, right? Do we, have they stepped on their scale? at their home without telling, they're not going to call us and say, Hey, I gained 20 pounds. Right. But we have to be responsible for their outcomes. And if we don't make ourselves responsible for their outcomes, we're practicing crap medicine. If we just care about that insurance check, I mean, Brian, we live that it's, life. It's even worse than go that, back, bro. Right. You know, it's even worse than that. My old patients who I, some of them are following me for metabolic health stuff. They're like, man, the old practice is bugging the heck out of me. I just had my physical in November and they're like bugging me to come in for a physical again. And it's like, I just had it. Why? Well, because in January 1st, all your diagnosis codes go away. The insurance company doesn't get paid till they see you again this year as a senior. So the more diagnosis codes you have, so this is the game, the problem. This is the truth. Any doc out there isn't going to argue with this. If I don't get your diagnosis codes captured, I don't get paid as much. And guess what? Your insurance company doesn't get paid as much. And you don't get a bonus that year because those diagnoses don't exist till you see them for that problem. Unless they end up in the hospital and they code it there. So there's a big, big, big conflict of interest there because the more sick you get, the more I get paid. So for me, the reason I got burned out is I was working 14 hour days. 80% of the people didn't really care. They said, throw me a pill. And so now in my practice, people come to me for this expertise. And I go, look, if you just don't want to change, you don't want to stop eating donuts and drinking orange juice for breakfast every day. I can't help you. You're wasting your money. Go to the guy who'll just give you drugs. That's the road you're on. Pick the pick your path, right? Yeah. And then you look at the cost yeah. of meds and drugs and it's ridiculous. And, and, and Dr. O'Meara, I have a ton of respect because now that I'm practicing this kind of medicine that Tro dragged me into, by the way, um, you know, I'm seeing, I'm sorry, I started to see people with a lot of visceral fat not losing weight on the scale. You and I have had sidebars and I appreciate your time on this, but you are the pioneer in this. No one, to my knowledge, no one before you was talking about um, visceral fat and losing visceral fat and muscle mass coming on at the same time. And I think we're, we're having more data and I've had a lot of discussion behind the scenes with smart scientists. I'm just a primary care doc, but you know, this is a huge, this is probably the biggest thing I can think of in and people getting their health back because again, it's not about weight loss; it's about metabolic health. It really is, and I, you know, I think this target visceral fat is incredibly important, and I, I uh, always look for opportunities to promote it, promote awareness about it, and uh, the importance of eliminating. We spent, and I don't want to get into cholesterol because it's just a waste of time, but that that's where they make money off of, and so we need to figure out how you can you you can be a part of a system, eliminate something that's going to make a difference. So. I'll just cut to chase. Why does visceral fat work 
as a target to improve health and improve metabolic health, starting with that and just reverse disease processes. Because when you really look at research and we do a lot of research, but you know, you got to look at data, you got to look at metrics. So how do you evaluate research? Which, which you need, there's two things you need to look at. You need to look at the signal and you need to look at um, the noise. So this signal to noise ratio tells you of the validity of what you're looking at. So if you're looking at something that has um, a very low signal to noise ratio, noise is distraction, looking at something that really doesn't have uh, a strong connection. Signal is looking at something where so something's high, high signal means it really is connected to what you're looking at, outcome. So cholesterol is really bad signal to noise ratio because you see these studies where the lower the cholesterol, the higher the mortality. That's not good. That's not a really, that's not a, you know, a direct relationship you want to look at, but visceral fat, damn, that one works. You get rid of that and their lives dramatically improve. That is the single finest signal to noise ratio I am aware of. And so that's why I'm passionate about getting people to understand that. And this is really important if you're going to improve human beings I think we can learn something from the business world because business, they've been making money a long time and they keep making corporations better. Look at the, the enormity behind Amazon and many of these corporations is because they look at the right things to improve the bottom line health of that company, which is profitability. And what they look at is something called KPI, Key Performance Indicators. So a portion of your audience, there is in the business world, will understand what KPI is. But the physicians need to understand what KPI is because it's been part of what we've done in conventional health space, but it all goes towards revenue, CPT coding to build revenue uh, for you know, our, our medical practices, our healthcare systems, the insurance companies. So there are key performance indicators, but what does improve? Profitability of everybody part of that system not the patient's health. So change the KPI to improve the health of, instead of the health of the system, the health of the patient. And now you, by looking at better metrics that are specifically designed for that, specifically visceral fat, and then you'll really optimize people's health. And I think they'll start, individuals will start being willing to pay for it. So I changed the name KPI to KBI and I call it key biological indicators. So what can you look at in the human being? We're starting to look at it. We're looking at uh, ketones. We're going to look at glucose, we're, you know, and looking at visceral fat. These, these are all important biomarkers uh, and many other things. And, you know, and I, as, I saw, as I saw visceral fat being eradicated in people, I saw their faces change. And I can, I can see visceral fat in, in people's face. I mean, they're, we scanned over 4,000 abdomens looking at visceral fat. So after scanning so many people in my practice, I would see their face and then scan them. I began to associate the, the appearance of the face. So the future, I, my opinion, is going to be uh, photographic analysis of faces. You're going, you're going to be able to do artificial intelligence, machine learning, looking at faces and be able to make diagnosis through little nuanced findings the machine will learn. And uh, if uh, Amazon, or Microsoft, some forward thinking engineers listening to us today, get a hold of me, I'd be happy to, to help uh, teach a machine how to start doing that. Because if a dummy like me can do this, walk it down Mall of America or in my medical practice measuring visceral fat, a really smart, highly trained, sophisticated machine is going to do it way better. You know, I want to talk about three key things just so our listeners understand you know, one of the reasons why we don't like body mass index as a general marker of health is because uh, you can actually have an increase in mortality as your BMI drops down. Uh, and it's not a great, it's a surrogate marker. It's not looking at really what matters. If you look at total body fat, just the fat using one of the body composition scales that Brian or I have in our office, right? Um, or better yet, if you could with an MRI, right? Uh, that'd be great or a DEXA scan. Um, but if you look at total body fat and visceral fat, they actually have a linear relationship with mortality, 
right? Meaning the lower your organ fat goes, the healthier you are. The lower, you know, as your total body fat approaches about 50 pounds or less, you know, that, that graph is pretty much straight down. The more you lose, the more total body fat you lose, the more your mortality improves. And another quick and easy way, let's say you don't have Dr. Romero's expensive equipment or the expensive equipment in my office and, 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 you know, Dr. Lenska's office, you're just your waist to height ratio has an almost linear relationship. So if your waist is half of your height, okay, you know that you're in good shape because as the, the good doctor said, your visceral fat is probably very low. Um, and you're yeah, you could go right. grab a string and put it around your waist and keep, if that string overlaps later, you're doing better. That's all you got to do. Cut a string, put it on your waist. You don't need our fancy machines necessarily, but there are some things that will trick you, but that is a huge deal. You know, that's and, visceral and fat, by the way, that's what we lose first. I saw an interesting study, Dr. O'Meara, and I wanted to bring it to your attention. There was a, a small study, but very clear signal. They took overweight or obese patients with insulin resistance. Okay. And they stratified them to two diets, basically low fat and low carb. And, uh, what I, what I found was pretty interesting. The patients who were insulin resistant, you know, all those, uh, women who gain a lot of weight during pregnancy, you know, the, the postmenopausal women who are all of a sudden insulin resistant, resistant, the men in their later age who are testosterone drops and they get more insulin resistance, right? These people the, in this study who are more insulin resistant, decreased visceral fat the most, right? So if you went on a low carb diet, you actually had more visceral fat loss than a low fat diet, even though the weights were the same. It's like, uh, if you were insulin resistant, the fat came off your organs. Uh, if you did low carb, which I found to be remarkable, you probably already knew this, but what are your thoughts yeah. about that? Yeah, no, it's exactly right. We see it all the time that, uh, that visceral fat vanishes. And, uh, it, we would see people lose visceral fat, get so healthy. They put on muscle tissue and, uh, they didn't think they were losing weight because they were simultaneously building muscle tissue. And I remember uh, a firefighter once going through our MRI scanner and we, we showed him how much visceral fat he'd lost, how much muscle he put on. And that, why he wasn't having the dramatic weight loss he was hoping to have. And he broke down and cried because of the passion he felt from getting the insights of what was going on. So, you know, body mass index, you know, and, and just stepping on a scale, you know, looking at weight is not going to be as strong of a signal to follow as looking at that visceral fat. But you're, you're exactly right. I, and I'm thrilled that you know, once you start living properly, nature gets rid of that visceral fat. And Dr. Uh, Bickman, Ben Bickman has done a lot of, a lot of really great work looking at visceral fat and the processes, you know, behind it. I, you know, I don't pretend to be, you know, to possess the biochemical expertise that Dr. Bickman and other people have with regard to, I'm more of a, you know, a macro guy. You know, I look at the, the basic things, the big things going on, relate them to life, figure out these relationships and tell people what they got to do uh, to, to get healthy. Uh, but I think it's important to understand all those those minute details as well to have an expertise. But I, I tend to be somebody <clears throat> I know a lot about visceral fat, but I know, you know, I'm an inch thick, you know, 10,000 miles wide. I do lots and lots of strategies uh, to help people uh, become optimally healthy. But visceral fat is just something that uh, we really need to be educating med students on uh, in medical school and, uh, you know, talking about it and educating physicians, uh, doing CMEs and medical lectures and grand rounds on uh, visceral fat because it, it just has such a dramatic improvement. It, it is the marker. It is the marker. I think that's the problem. We've been looking at BMI. Look at Sean Baker. His BMI is high. You're going to say, oh, he's out of shape. He's terrible. No, he has no visceral fat. So you can have a guy who weighs way more or way less than Sean Baker and not have any muscle mass because muscle we know weighs more than fat. So when you start looking, it's like we've known this for 60 years, by the way, guys. This is not something that we just invented. You look at the literature. The problem is it never translated into practice. That's why guys like Ben Bickman, who I have a ton of respect for also, he does this stuff. He goes, Brian, no one was listening. We're showing them what insulin does. We're showing, and no one listened. 
no one's checking insulin levels. No one's. And I'm like, how do they not see the science? How do they like, uh, you know, what's like one of those pictures that's all blurry. And then you see it and you go, oh, my gosh, guys, because I think like what you're saying, the benefit, the crazy thing about this is it's not going to be the life. In, I mean, the, the health insurance companies who get it first, it's going to be the life insurance guys going, holy cow, look, if we decrease visceral fat, even if they have a higher BMI body mass index, they're healthier. Right. And, and so I think life insurance, they're the ones who are going to key in on this. And they are already because they're seeing, oh, my goodness, visceral fats, the markers, not your weight, because I have a lady, you guys will be interested in this. She's 246 pounds. She has 0.8 liters of visceral fat. Right. And I have other guys like Nick Norwitz, who has he weighs 137 pounds cut and he has more visceral fat than his mom, who is overweight. Right. Because it's where you store that energy. And I think this is going to be the key to figuring this out, because if you have love handles, they're not killing you compared to what the visceral fat's doing. I think we're all in agreement on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So a lot of uh, it's been my experience that most premenopausal women tend to accumulate more subcutaneous fat and less visceral fat. So when we scan them, they they have a, a disproportionate higher amount of subcutaneous fat when it comes to total body fat relative to, to that deep visceral fat. And it's probably associated with uh, the advantages that nature provides them from the reproductive cycle that's conferred upon women and uh, their role in child rearing that uh, nature allows them that. But uh, you know, when, when menopause kicks in, I call it the great equalizer, uh, we see, you know, empirically, pathologically, women start catching up with men then with uh, heart attacks and strokes. Uh, but it's really, that, again, that relationship to visceral fat. So uh, absolutely, you know, subcutaneous fat is, in my opinion, you want a little bit of subcutaneous fat. These, these guys that are these bodybuilders ripped and you see every shred and every vein. Uh, to me, it, it's it's uh, not a healthy appearance, and probably from a natural uh, from a nature perspective, probably means they're they're living too close to the edge, and you want a little layer of subcutaneous fat to provide some additional you know uh, gas in your your gas tank from a, a more ketogenic existence. So, yeah, I think uh, subcutaneous fat is misinterpreted by a lot of people as unhealthy and undesirable, but the studies show uh, the association uh, and connection to disease with visceral fat, not subcutaneous fat. You know, I, I wanna talk about this a little bit because when somebody, you know, I've always thought about why is it that, uh, you know, the, the standard medical approach, you know, kind of says, hey, it doesn't matter what diet you do, just cut your calories. The standard approach is any diet that works and right, and what we're finding here is that, no, actually, if you have insulin resistance, if your glucose is very variable, if you're, you know, if you have prediabetes, diabetes, you actually may benefit more from a low carbohydrate approach. It's certainly any diet can cause weight loss. You can just not eat. You can eat plants. Any diet can cause weight loss, but it's trying to select the right diet for the right patient. Now, if I have, you know, an elite athlete you know, in my office saying, Hey, they want to consider a diet. I may not recommend the same diet that I would, you know, for somebody who's, uh, got high visceral fat has high glycemic variability, pre-diabetes, right. It would be a different recommendation. So what are your thoughts on kind of figuring out the host and figuring out how to tailor that diet? I mean, maybe you've talked about paleo, you've talked about keto. How do you tailor you know, the, and you've talked about performance athletes. We know you deal with performance athletes. So how do you, you know, can you give us an idea of how you give your dietary advice across the spectrum? Yeah. So I get a wide variety of uh, clients that, that uh, come to me and I've worked with in, in the past over the past, uh, really, you know, seven to seven years or so that, uh, they it's really based on their objective. So, you know, if you want to build muscle and you want to look like a bodybuilder or you want to look like an NFL player, then carbohydrates probably have a role uh, in, in, in what you want to do. But if you want to be functionally healthy, where you look good and you functionally perform well, then, then I think, uh, you know, adopting a high fat, low carbohydrate, keto carnivore existence is, is the way to go. So I basically approach it to whatever the client wants. I use the MRI to look at to track those muscle to fat ratios, still take and look at that. But yeah, I, I have a hard time convincing my, uh, my professional athlete clients to, uh, to, to uh, go off of carbohydrates and uh, abandon them completely in, for a, a carnivore existence. 
And uh, I think I think we're going to find with time that a lot of the the dietary changes and strategies is uh, is driven uh, by the microbiome. So what what's interesting in where I practice in the Minneapolis area, Twin Cities regions, we have a very large Somali population, and the Somalis eat a lot of uh, uh, carbohydrates back home in Somalia. They're thin and they they you know they are healthy, but they come here and continue to eat not American food. They they don't assimilate to American diets. They eat halal. They eat and they purchase in Somali grocery stores, Somali rest, uh, restaurants. They eat Somali food. They're not eating Western food. Why are they putting on the weight? Microbes. You have a different set of microbes that they have joined our community. They may not be eating what we're doing, but those microbes are obesogenic. They're pathogenic. They cause weight gain. They cause a different metabolic response to these carbohydrates. And voila, now these Somalis that were thin, eating the same thing in Somalia that they're eating here in America suddenly are gaining weight. So that's a huge black box that we have to start looking at. We have to deal with it. You know, I see physicians just don't understand the microbiome and push it away because we just don't know enough about it. No, we, we can look at what's happening to communities. We can see the influence of probiotic foods and fermented foods and, and abstaining from food preservatives, you know, processed foods that introduce these harmful chemicals and chlorinated water and fluoridated water that disrupt our oral microbiome. So um, that is a critical part of my practice in trying to help people with uh, dietary and lifestyle strategies to optimize their health. And once you get the microbiome right, cravings go away. You can solve the problems with the, the addiction cravings because that's that's what is causing people to have cravings for this food is these microbes are obesogenic. They can't crawl out of your body when your patients are succumbing to these crazy cravings that are so intense. These microbes that are demanding a dietary dependency upon carbohydrates and processed foods for the simple sugars they can't leave. So they've wired into, we don't understand it, but I'm just telling you, this is what I honestly believe. They've wired into our nervous systems to be able to influence uh, the brains and, and the thinking patterns of, of their host recipients to go out and eat the food that they need to eat. Now you kill them by, you know, starving to death and replacing them with beneficial microbes, optimizing the microbiome, they no longer can influence because they're not there to, to cause those cravings anymore. And that's how, how it goes away. So I tell my clients that are struggling with obesity and have, uh, 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 you know, weight problems and massive cravings that their number one problem is there is an infection. They're infected with, with pathogenic, obesogenic microbes. The, what are some good foods that you think that you recommend for, for this problem? Like, you know, just low, like, would you recommend kimchi or do you recommend, uh, sauerkraut what do you what do you recommend for people to help get the gut microbiome because I, I agree with you it's a black box that we don't understand we go okay just cut the carbs and, and not really look at what how do we replete especially in the in the era of antibiotics for everything yeah so right away i get them uh eating um a carnivore diet you know eliminating first of all any any dietary introduction of the foods that the obesogenic pathogenic microbes are demanding and want to, you know, sustain themselves with. So, and then, and then I sub, have them supplement with kimchi, uh, probiotic sauerkraut. I had a fascinating, I just had a, a chairman of board of a bank. He's an interesting guy. He's, he's one of my most interesting and favorite clients. Now he's just a brilliant guy. Uh, he, he had lifelong addiction to hemorrhoids as an adult, constantly a hemorrhoids. Uh, he's an older gentleman in his seventies. Uh, he goes carnivore and his hemorrhoids go completely away. No more no more hemorrhoids. But he listened to me on a podcast before he became my client. And he said, all right, I'm going to try this sauerkraut thing that Dr. Romero talked about on, you know, on one of the kids. So he had one teaspoon, <laughs> one teaspoon of sauerkraut. The only problem was it was not fermented. He got, you know, uh, the sauerkraut that was basically pickled. So it wasn't fermented, which removes these lectins. Boom. The next day, hemorrhoids. He hadn't had them for, I think, three years. And then he gets uh, then he gets hemorrhoids from one teaspoon of uh, sauerkraut. So um, now I got a meeting fermented sauerkraut 
which by the way, ferment, ferment, when you ferment vegetables, it eliminates these saponins and lectins and things that, you know, Dr. Gundry and, and uh, Paul Saladino and, and a, lot of, a lot of us in our space are now starting to recognize these, these, these plant toxins, these roles these plant toxins have. They're eliminated when you ferment. So uh, you have to have probiotic, fermented sauerkraut, Kefir is another great uh, for those that, that can tolerate uh, dairy, uh, kefir, yogurt, and uh, fermented, fermented vegetables of uh, any kind, as long as you ferment them, um, have some, some role. But you don't have to eat a lot because, you know, these are not a nutrient value. You don't consume these, in my opinion, for their, their nutritional value as much as their macro their microbiome value. So I have my clients, uh, instead of grazing on food where they normally would eat every 15 minutes carbohydrates, I have them grazing on microbes every 15 minutes, you know, sipping on probiotic, you know, sauerkraut, diluted sauerkraut juice, diluted kimchi juice, you know, diluted apple cider vinegar, getting these beneficial microbes, probiotic microbes, uh, into their system constantly, you know, and there are hardly any caloric value, you know, again, it's, it's not, uh, it's not really introducing caloric, um, intake into your body. And, and I'm not a believer, nor do I subscribe to seek out. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe you can show up by science, but you know, it's the calories that get absorbed, not the calories in. And if the microbiome is disrupted, you might be absorbing way many more calories in then if your microbiome is optimized and metabolizing those calories properly, allowing nutrition to go in instead of caloric energy. So the Seco guys, Dr. Nadolsky, and you know, uh, what's, what's the guy you're gonna be, a uh, broke, a uh, brain, what, what's, you're gonna be debating him, Tro, what's his name? The, the- uh, <laughs> I know Lane. Lane Norton, yeah. Lane Norton. Yeah. yeah, look, Those guys, you know, I think- That, that issue. Yeah, here's the here's the issue in modern medicine. Okay, you know it's funny when you look at obesity studies with microbiome, and when we give people, you know, prebiotic supplements, uh, probiotic supplements, nobody does better, right? So if you take somebody with obesity and give them prebiotics and probiotics in the form of a pill, nobody's done better. So it's been a wash, right? It's been a wash. In fact, if you have pancreatitis and you get probiotics, it actually gets worse, right? So the problem is, is I don't think we understand it, but then look at the other parts of the microbiome that we do understand. If you have severe protein, calorie, malnutrition, and kwashiorkor, and you take that microbiome and transplant it into a mouse, the mouse gets kwashiorkor. Okay. Yeah. So meaning that kwashiorkor is mediated by the microbiome. Okay. When you take somebody with kwashiorkor and you take their twin and you do a fecal transplant, their kwashiorkor gets better. There's yep. the, the, right. This kwashiorkor is this, you know, state where you see it, where they're, you know, they have all this edema, and you see it in probably malnourished children. You've everybody's seen the picture of it. They know of it. They they get edema in their legs, and right. So there is something to the microbiome. If you have C diff, Brian, right? What do we hear about C diff recently? Right? Yeah. You know, C diff is is this infection that affects the colon, and we know now if you transport, if you transplant actual stool, if you do a stool transplant. C. diff goes away, right? Yeah. So now we yeah. know that if you alter the microbiome, we can affect kwashiorkor, which is a protein deficiency, you know, uh, and then we can affect uh, C. diff through a fecal transplant, which is like the, the you know, the, the almost 100% efficacy. And the last thing that I saw that, I, that really, you know, made me like kind of really impressed by this microbiome area of research is, with the seizure prevention of a ketogenic diet. Everybody knows we use a ketogenic diet in patients with epilepsy. They actually showed in, in mouse, they made epileptic mouse, that it is the microbiome, okay? It's something to do with the microbiome that's actually causing this, um, this seizure prevention. It's not the necessarily the the ketones that it may be that the seizure prevention is actually mediated by the microbiome. It's tough. It's, you know, because as a primary doctor, evidence-based primary doctor, when somebody says microbiome, I kind of roll my eyes, right? I kind of roll my eyes because it's like, okay, well, there's, we don't really have 
a sta- like there's no standard, right? There's no, we don't know. We don't know enough. Like well, I, think, in modern I think the medicine, problem, I think enough. what Sean's saying, but there's so much is there. This. I think like, what he's saying so is this, there. you can't have a terrible diet and then supplement your way out of it. You have to get the diet right. And then you get the microbiome right. Also, you have to do both. Yeah. You can't, it's just like eating terrible diet and say, Oh, I'm taking omega three. So I'll be healthy. And you eat donuts yeah. all day. It, it's not going to yeah. help. It's like, I'm going to smoke and take an antioxidant. Good luck with that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's, and I think that's been the problem. A lot of the studies looking at probiotic use or looking at probiotic supplements and not looking at it in a, in a holistic way that the role of these micros play. So the FMTs, the fecal microbiotic transplants, you, you, it's a fascinating subject, like treating C. diff, how well it works. Do you know that they're now data mining those FMTs, uh, Dr. True? And what they're doing is to say, hey, we cured C. diff. Did we cure anything else? And guess what they found out? 20 people that had FMT were cured of their Crohn's. Their Crohn's went away. Now, how awesome is that? So you get an FMT, you got Crohn's, and and you also have C. diff. You get the the FMT, the transplant for the C. diff, not for Crohn's, because as you know, we can only treat it you know, uh, C. diff right now for an FMT, but it doesn't mean we can't look and see if anything else got better. So this one research paper is fantastic. I can send it to you. 20 people were, had their Crohn's reversed. And guess what? Of those 20 people that had their Crohn's disease, 11 of them came from one single donor. So what does that mean? That donor was a super donor. He had such valuable feces FMT, that his stool had such rich microbiome that he could cure people of other things, not just C. diff. So the future is going to be, you know, creating super donors, people with optimized microbiomes that would be able to benefit other people. And this, it's not Tro, really- just think, of, just think how much money Tro could make if you, he's so full of it that- <laughs> There we go, yeah. <laughs> donated that, man. Tro, yeah. that might be your way out, man. You know what? Sean, what, so here's the problem. So here's the thing. These prebiotic fiber. So when we talk about, uh, people ask me all the time about carbohydrates. And when it comes to yogurt, I tell them, don't worry about it. It's fermented, right? When I tell them about sauerkraut and, you know, about uh, uh, kimchi, don't worry about it. It's fermented, like pickled stuff. I, I tell them, don't worry about it. Okay, don't worry about it. Um, so, you know, I, I think there is certainly something to fermented carbohydrates because particularly we don't digest them from one element. And, but I, I have to tell you, you know, for somebody who's experimented with low carb replacement foods, you know, I think that there's some, some side to it is great because you're, you can kind of wean off the standard diet, but all of these foods have sugar alcohols and prebiotic fibers. And, you know, and now these ingredients are finding their way into basically everything, these prebiotic fibers that they're putting in and Sugar alcohols, what's your take on these and their effect on the microbiome? I just stay completely away from it. I, you know, I have never, um, I've, I've never had any uh, qualms or, or problems adopting the most natural approach to things, you know, so, and, and all these processed, prepackaged and manufactured food items that are chasing, you know, the health space um, are driven more for profit, you know, for the, 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 uh, the system behind them, then they are to actually improve people. So um, I, I tell people eat food in whole forms, just basically start just eating meat. And, uh, you know, if you if you're not going to adopt a carnivore diet, then, you know, uh, uh, eat, eat vegetables in whole form would be better than eating processed, you know, vegetables like fake meat, like they process the, you know, the Beyond Burger or Impossible Burger, what all that stuff is, it's just processed uh, vegetables. And so it's the processing that I think introduces in changed form um, harm to the to the human body, probably through oxidation and uh, disruption of the, the previously natural existing molecules and membranes uh, that were you know present in foods whole form uh, that now allow for such uh, deleterious you know harmful effects. Uh, on on humans that are ingesting them. So yeah, I agree. I think they're a disaster, and you know, I I, I stay have my clients stay completely away from them. 
what do you do if somebody says, you know, look, I, I can't get rid of chocolate or what do you do when they say I can't get rid of, you know, I have my kids are always around. They're eating X, Y and Z. I can't get rid of it. I can't get rid of it. Doc, what's the best for me to do? What do you say to them? Well, I get them started I'm on uh, addressing the addiction, you know, those those cravings. So, you know, I get them kill, kill the bad microbes, get them on the on, on eating meat. And then um, I have them sip on probiotic microbes all day long and hanging with healthier people. Part of the problem is when people, when you're around people that are filled with carbs, you know, eating carbs is that you're touching, you're getting their microbes. And this is why Oprah failed. Oprah lost weight, gained it back, lost weight, gained it back. Cause nobody told her you're not treating the infection. So as soon as she kind of got rid of those, she'd go out in the public, she'd get more of those microbes. And every single day I get obesogenic microbes in my mouth going down into my gut because I live in a world where I'm surrounded. So I constantly am grazing on fermented foods, getting beneficial microbes. And I hang with people like professional athletes are an interesting example, or even just high school, you know, pick up basketball games. When somebody does something awesome, people are high five in them. And the reason is nature tells you to go out and get those microbes off those high performers. When you, when the professional athletes go into an arena or a stadium, you see all the fans reaching their hands out to try to touch, you know, those professional athletes while they're going by. And it's nature time, harvest their microbes. So we are nothing more than just a bag of microbes living within a world. And your role is to get as many beneficial and good microbes as you possibly can. So that that's what I'm I gonna, do. I'm going to have to disagree with you, good doctor, because, you know, my wife has never had a weight problem. And, you know, we do a lot of high fiving and sometimes a little bit more than that. And, uh, you know, I don't think that it's actually helped me at all. So, so I'm going to have to disagree. With You've you maintained there. weight loss, Tro, so it must be doing something, man. It rubbed off on you. It takes a while for some people, man. You had to get all the bad stuff out. Now you're doing yeah. better, but it's pretty amazing because Tro, you're an example. Like what we're talking about, I, I want people to understand is look as a, as a case example, I have a guy who lost 44 pounds on a liquid diet before coming to me, but he was going crazy and fighting with everyone, miserable, starving all day. So he's, and, and so we put him on a ketogenic diet, low carb diet, in four months, he lost exactly zero pounds, right? I just talked to him yesterday. He's losing two pounds, five pounds, eight pounds, but he lost eight inches off his waist, put on a ton of muscle mass. So Troll, what I'm thinking is because you don't drink, you've got your body to a place where you have more muscle mass, less visceral fat than, you know, I, what I'm thinking is, and I think it's right, is that the more muscle mass you have, the less, and this is what I've been telling you about bio lane. You guys will argue with him, but I'm saying, look, if I'm bio lane, I can get away with more pop tarts because I have, it's going to my muscle. It's not going to your visceral fat. fat. I don't, I'm not suggesting that's the way to do it, but I'm saying he can get away with it now. But if he blows out his knee and he's sitting on his couch for a couple of months, he'll gain weight doing that. He won't be able to. Do, it really has to do with this energy where you're, where you're putting your energy to some degree. Because I have a guy who's a vegan that I'm intrigued by. Tro, I talked to you about him before. I think I've talked on the podcast a couple of times. He eats a ton of carbs, but he eats just fruits and vegetables, nothing outside. But he works out three hours a day right? He has no visceral fat. So it's not, he's not, I think what happens is once we start getting visceral fat, then we start getting more visceral fat, then it's harder to put muscle mass on. So if you start losing your muscle mass, you can't do that. And that's why these pro athletes will gain 40 pounds of the year they retire because now they're not, they're losing muscle mass, putting on visceral fat. Then they become human like the rest of us. I think that's what's happening. I was Brian. How do you know that the uh, vegan that you're, you're, you were talking about uh, eats a lot of carbohydrates and works out three hours a day, doesn't have visceral fat in? How old is he? Yeah, he's 20. That's the point. He's 27 years old, right? Yeah. He has a ton of mass from, from previous. He used to not be vegan, but he's been doing for three years, no emotional problems, no depression. He's doing like, a, like what you're talking about, sprint work and uh, uh, high intensity interval training. And so what I did is because I'm intrigued, I go, I want to get a CGM on him and a, a continuous glucose monitor. And I want to see what his baseline labs are at 27 years of age, because my bet was that he was going to have high triglycerides. Guess what? Triglycerides, normal, LDL, normal, everything, normal, A1C, insulin levels, normal, uh, continuous glucose monitor. If I had a diabetic that looked like that, I'd be freaking out. So I saw the CGM data first and I go, uh oh, he's in trouble because his sugars were spiking up and down and up and down. And then all of a sudden you look at everything's normal right now, because I'm thinking what has to be happening is his muscles are his glycogen stores. He depletes them with three hours of workout, but when he's married with three kids and he can't go work out, he's going to be in trouble down the road. He's going to put yeah. on visceral fat at some point, unless he's just genetically yeah. blessed to do I've this. I've been there. I've been, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll read his tea leaves. It's going to happen. 
Yeah, it's going to happen. I agree. I think it's going to happen yeah. unless he maintains what he's doing. But then he's maintaining what he's doing to get away with the carbohydrates. That's what I'm saying. We become hostage to that. So if he was a carnivore, I'd say he's going to be good the rest of his life. I'm not worried about him, right? It would be a different because he doesn't have to get rid of all the extra carbs. But I think what happens, and like I told him, I go, look, if my 300 pound patient came to me and wanted to do your diet, I'd tell him, no, this is why when people say you guys are a one trick pony and this is all you do, I'm like, no, look at the patient, right? Some guys I look at, him, I go, look, yeah, but all you have to do is monopolize your muscle mass. And you're, you know, if, if I have, for me, the reason it's been a battle is because I had a ton of visceral fat, right? So I have to battle that visceral fat. That's like, Oak, even though I have some muscle mass, I still got to fight through the, the, that, right? So as you put on muscle mass, and you get rid of visceral. It's kind of it's, the way I have to look at it is like we have to be like the opposite of a bear, right? The hibernating bear, like we talked about, Sean, they get a ton of visceral fat. They inhibit muscle mass. They hibernate for six months because if they had a ton of muscle mass, they would go through their visceral fat in two months or three months. So they get there's a there's a survival benefit to the bear not to have skeletal muscle. But the problem with us, as you're talking, as you 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 were talking earlier, exactly what happens? We lose our ability as we get older to maintain the subcutaneous fat. So postmenopausal women. If they have the same visceral fat as a man, they're at the same heart cardiac risk because yeah. it used to be subcutaneous. Now you can't store it there. So I think what, ha- what I think with the way I'm envisioning, it may not be right mechanistically, but uh, we know visceral fat is very sensitive to stress hormones, right? Like cortisol. So if you mobilize your subcutaneous fat and you're stressed all day and you're not exercising, what does it do? It restores in the visceral fat. And that may be part of this whole shifting from subcutaneous to visceral. Plus we lose the hormones that are sh- shunting it that way. So guys like BioLane who have a ton of testosterone floating around are shunting it to subcutaneous. And if they're burning it, who cares? But if they lose their testosterone effect, now it's going visceral. Now you're in trouble. And that's what happens postmenopausal. That's what happened to us men. As we get older, we get more visceral fat. Uh, And and so we get into a disaster. When the more visceral fat, it's harder to put the muscle back. Like you're showing. That's why your data is so important to me. Yeah, the uh, the young carbs, carbaholics that are uh, uh, doing a lot of exercise uh, over in the, that guy is just young and he's healthy. He's eating a lot of carbs and he's exercising, but he's accumulating uh, the damage from elevated reactive oxygen species. I mean, I har- I hardly exercise. I over the past ten years, I averaged about five uh, five five to ten minutes once every three days. That's hard. That's how I'd, how I'd exercise a minimal amount. So my reactive oxygen species, you know, influence, uh, you know, total damage from that was minimal compared to, you know, you look at an NFL player, you know, and professional athletes and these, uh, endurance runners, they just, they, they churn out so much reactive oxygen species, uh, especially if they're carving out, um, that, that they have a excessive amount of accumulated damage. Versus, you know, if you look at, and this is how, how we figured out our strategies, uh, Brian, is that we looked at, you know, there's only one species that is diseased and filled with chronic disease uh, that roams the earth because, and, that, and that's humans, that animals in the wild don't uh, because we eat what we shouldn't eat. We don't eat what we should eat. And then we exercise in a very dramatically different m- manner than all the other animal species. The other animal species are doing very, very high intense struggles life and death they're hunting each other they're killing each other trying to get away um but it's very brief and it's it's over and yep. so what happens if we, you know we we adopt those you know strategies and that's what we found what reverses chronic disease eat what you should eat don't eat what you shouldn't and then you exercise in a manner that's kind of life and death uh, struggles that animals encounter very infrequently they don't have these fights every single day they, you know, they, they get, they, they get it at, you know, kind of a life and death encounter, maybe once, you know, once a week or something. So that's pretty much all yeah. you really do to optimize your health. But these, that, yeah. that young looks good right now, low visceral fat, but let's take a look at him when he's 40 and 50, you're going to see uh, damage. You're going to see visceral fat accumulation from the same uh, dietary lifestyle strategies. He's trying to, he, he's getting away with right now. He's not going to be able to get away with later. hundred percent agree. So, That's exactly what I told him. I go, you could get away with it now. We could get out like, you know, when you're in grade school, you can get away with a lot more stuff. When you're my age, you can't do that anymore. You're going to be in trouble. So you might as well start looking at that now. That's exactly the advice I told him too. It's like, I don't like those sugar f- shifts up and down like that because, you know, we know those can break plaques and cause more damage. It's like freezing the, the water and breaking the rock apart, you know, and, and you keep keep repeating that process and you break a, apart boulders. And that's what I think a lot of this we're seeing with diabetes. And, you know, again, 
we said we're going to control the sugar. We're going to shoot you with insulin. What's the insulin do? Shove it into your visceral fat. You've, you, you've just yeah. increased your, your mortality. And, and who, who you're not going to see talking when they're, I'm 57, is by Elaine. You know, that guy. You're not going to see Dr. Nadolsky. You're not going to see these these people that promote what eat whatever you want kind of, you know, seco. It's all calories and, and the vegans. They don't make it long term. The carnivore is kind of a newer thing, but it's it's the long term lower carbohydrate uh, keto um, proponents that are faithful to that that are going to be healthy in their long and their elder years. So it's just going to take a little bit for the public to figure this out. But that's why um, you know you don't see older vegans, long term vegans. You know you see beautiful young people and the game changers, right? That's all they have to work with. You're not going to see Dr. McDougal take his shirt off. You're not going to see these other, you know, Dr. McGregor take their shirt off. Uh, they're going to be wearing clothes and stuff. They can't, they, they don't look good. And, and you won't see, by the other token, though, you won't see Ted Namath putting his shirt on. Or Sean Baker <laughs> putting his shirt on very often, right? Because they've, they've busted their butt to get with that. And I, th- I agree with you 100%. I think the problem is we're, and this is why I've been telling true, we're looking at different prototypes. Like if you're looking at, you know, if you got a brand new car, <laughs> it's going to run pretty good for a while. If you got a car that's 40 years old, it's going to take some, you know, nurturing and, 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 and you have to keep it running. So I think that I, I, I we're in a hundred percent agreement. I go, I, I don't agree with, I was told him that like, if it's for ethical reasons, okay, you got to make the best of what you got. And, and he doesn't eat processed food at all. He doesn't eat grains. He doesn't eat pasta and bread. He eats fruits and vegetables, this, this, this vegan guys, but he, he makes protein shakes that are like, you know, two bananas, a bunch of stuff. Cause he's burning that fuel. Right. But he, in his mind, he's thinking he needs those extra carbs. I'm like, you really don't, you need extra protein. And that's going to be his long-term issue too. I think it's going to be hard to sustain the muscle mass and, and keep the visceral fat down. But it's, you know, at the moment right now, when I look at space, I was like, okay, let's, let's tie that exactly what I said. I go, we'll talk in 10 years, man. And I want to see your numbers again. And he's right. a good friend with Ben Bikikio, who I love. And, and so, you know, it, we'll be able to follow him long-term and see the effects of this for sure. You know, and I, I just yeah. want to come back to something you said, Dr. O'Meara, and something that, you know, Brian's been bringing up basically as we age, things change. And, uh, we also talked about exercise and this kid's exercising a lot. Um, I, I, I'm actually more of a proponent of exercise. I, I've exercised a long time, but I want, and actually, if you talk to Ben Bacchio, who is the expert in, you know, exercising in a minimal amount of time, if you talk to him like Ben, you know, what's your exercise routine? He says eight minutes, it takes me eight to 15 minutes, you know, a couple of times a week. Right. But if you also talk to him, you know, that he plays tennis, he goes on walks, he goes on hikes, Right. There's actually a ton of activity there. So actually a lot of activity. And you were talking about these animals, you know, doing minimal exercise, but we know bears after hibernation travel for miles and miles, basically like hundreds of miles to go from where they hibernated from to where they go. And this is like normal for them. This is migrate migrations. These great migrations occur where people are just doing kind of flying down or walking down, going through crazy uh, terrains. A lot of times dogs, for example, will uh, stalk their prey for, for a whole day, right? They'll just keep going after them. And, and so these wild animals, as you said, they, they're, you know, it's not like they're sitting around doing nothing and then they do eight minutes of activity and think that like they're going to get healthy. No, you definitely need activity. You just don't need to go kill yourself, you know, one month for the year, you know, basically for two hours a day, because that's what you think health is. No, you can do some resistance training and like, and some hit in 30 to 45 minutes. And then you can just go walk with your loved ones and call it a day. You can go, you know, hiking and biking and, you know, rowing and towing and whatever it is, right. You just get otherwise activity. I think the problem is, is we're not wild animals, you know? And so when we tell people, Hey, eight minutes is all you need. The message does gets lost in translation. Well, you, you know, Tro, I'll, I'll answer to that a little bit. I, I think what, what Sean's talking about, what I'm talking about is, look, if, if we're talking about breaking down visceral fat, Ben's workout spikes interleukin-6, interleukin-10, interleukin-15. Sprint work will do that and doing a, a muscle fatigue exercise. So what you're doing is you're making those tissues as insulin sensitive as they can be. You're lowering your insulin levels down and you're breaking down visceral fat. That energy is being released so that your muscles can use it. So there's going to be a big difference between doing a high-intensity workout, I, I would say, and jogging, for instance, in the bang for your buck. So running 45 minutes on the treadmill versus 
15 minutes of doing this kind of workout. I think there's a huge difference. And I've seen it on my continuous glucose monitor. I've seen it with tracking my ketones. And so I'm telling you, I'm a believer because I've seen the physiology of what's happening. Doesn't mean you sit on your butt the rest of the time. No, absolutely not. Those yeah. are activities and you, you move go. and you do stuff and you go play tennis and you go for a walk and you work in the garden. I, you know, I have an 83 year old lady. They put on 11,000 steps, 83 years old. 11,000 steps, work in the yard, going for a walk at the park, right? So she doesn't have to sprint. She can't sprint, but she's doing band workouts now at 83 and she's getting healthier and her sugars are getting better. So I think there's definitely, I think the point is, look, don't say I don't have time to work out and I can't do 15 minutes twice a week. Is good. I guarantee you're watching TV shows that you could tell me all about, but in that 15 minutes, you could lift some weights or do a little something. And I would rather work out like Sean does and look like he does than work out three hours a day every day and not have a family life. I don't know if this yeah. happened to you guys, Dr. O'Meara, Dr. Lenskis. I don't know if that, I was 350 pounds. I would go do my 20 minutes on the treadmill and then take the elevator in the hospital. Like, did anybody else do that? I mean, am I the only one? Like, so yeah, absolutely. I agree. I with started you, taking the stairs in my old days because I had to. Yeah. You know, this was like, the eighth floor above. I go, okay, I'll take the elevator because I want to be sweaty. But other than that, I'll take the, I'll take the stairs. I don't remember the last elevator I've been in. I'm just going to tell you guys, I made a commitment to myself about five years ago, never to take the elevator because Exactly this principle. I'm not going to go kill myself in the gym and then take the elevator. It doesn't make sense. Hey, Troy, let's grab a couple of questions. I know we, we're, we're going over it. And, and this, it. I knew this hour would go by way too fast, but let's grab a couple because I want to make sure everyone's questions are answered. And Yeah, and, let's do uh, it. We have some live, yeah. uh, Dr. Romero, we have some, uh, you know, lot, you know pe- our Patreon supporters, people from our practice, they're joining us live. So we're going to open it up to their questions. Guys, if you're here and you want to ask a question to Dr. Romero, now is the time. Oh, wow. We got some already here. Okay. All right. So um, let's start. Okay. Um, how do you know which diet is the, is the diet? What, what diet is right for you? I like this. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's the, uh, the, the real $64,000 uh, question. And so what I j- basically get my clients to do is start on the ultimate you know, elimination diet. Then they can, they can add in certain foods as they like with time. So I recommend giving it a trial of carnivore or a really low carb ketogenic diet to get started on. And then they can gradually reintroduce foods and track you know, it's, it's input. So that, that's my first recommendation, but ultimately you got to find the diet that gives you the best results, but you got to find the metrics, you know, how do you know that diet dietary change that you're introducing is a beneficial or not? So people would add in rice when I get them on a, on a, on a low carb ketogenic diet, and we'd see the accumulation of visceral fat start coming back in. So they weren't aware of it, you know, and we could see that in three days, you know, just over a weekend, visceral fat accumulating from the introduction of rice, uh, having the benefit of an MRI. So I think it's important to have metrics to follow uh, and not just following your taste buds. I'm, I'm a 100% agreement. Um, I got another question here. Okay, actually, I'm, I'm glad that Carlos here asked this question because I'm 100% agreement with him. I saw an amazing MRA that you showed where blood flow on a low carb diet in the brain literally improved. So um, this question comes from Carlos. Can you quickly discuss, you know, other modalities and your dietary modalities for improving blood flow? Yeah, so um, in that particular uh, image that he was he was talking about, we, we, we were able to reverse a large plaque in a uh, middle cerebral artery by uh, having the uh, client at that time adopt a high fat, low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. But we also had them walking, doing what animals do, lots of movement. So they, and we got them to stop running instead of jogging 10 miles at a time, five times a week. We got them to sprint. We got them to eat fermented foods. We got them outdoors getting sunshine. Well, we got them sleeping better at nighttime. Uh, We we got him uh, exercising in a very high intense manner. Uh, we got him to do a sauna. We got him to do cold showers. So these these strategies that um, have been shown to be beneficial in studies, if you put them together, it's called stacking. So people that take a lot of supplements, stack supplements together, kind of take them together. Well, if you take these lifestyle strategies and you stack them together, you get you get optimi- optimization of the re- disease reversal process. So th- that's a great question, uh, Carlos. And and I think the future is going to be looking at atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, measuring it, <clears throat> and then having people adopt uh, beneficial lifestyle changes and watching that uh, that 
that benefit go away. As so a follow-up, ben- are you seeing that in coronary calcium also? Have you looked at uh, that or not uh, really? Yeah, CT scans, you know, the, the CAC scores that are going on, they're just looking at those calcified uh, plaques. We don't, you know, we don't do, I use an MRI, so, uh, uh, but the benefit of the MRI is you see uh, displacement. You see, you see blood flow or a lack of, you know, blood being displaced by those soft plaques or, or hard plaques, wherever they may be in those particular arteries. And then uh, as, as a consequence, you know, when those arteries open up, you know, uh, my pulse sites open up. You know, I have visible dorsalis pedis. I have visible posterior tibialis. My client's pulses are visible. Brachial artery pulses are visible. Now my veins, get this, my veins are now pulsating, not my arteries. You can go on YouTube I'm a channel. witness. You showed me the video. I'm a witness, man. Yeah. I'm yeah. It's just the capillary Amazing. beds. Are so what better, you know, uh, body of vasculature open up than where the magic happens in the capillaries. So the only way veins are going to pulse is if the arteries can transmit that pulsatile systolic systole, syst- yeah. systolic blood flow through the capillary beds and into the veins. And that's that's what's happening as as you you build these dietary strategies, lifestyle strategies. Uh, and not just, you know, talking about um, a particular diet. There's, there's, it's a big world out there of health um, for the audience. And you got to do a lot of things to get, get the and, blood flow. And we haven't even touched based on your nitric oxide. I know we talked about erectile function getting better and mental function getting better with lifestyle changes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's huge. I mean, that, 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 that's a big, big cell, you know, Viagra will, will improve erectile dysfunction, but if you do these things, you know, not only do you get better erectile functioning, but you get throbbing. I mean, that, that is the quintessential, you know, erectile functioning that you want that, you know, you have when you're like 17, right? 17, maybe 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And that goes away, goes away because you're diseased. But if you open up that blood flow, you know, you get these pulse sites all over your body. And then, you know, my clients, I get them to have, you know, that kind of a, a, a not only just a very firm erection, but a, that kind of a pulsatile erection that you'd have when you're a teenager. Viagra will never do that. So, you and know, Tro's taking copious notes here. Just slow down, Tro. Your <laughs> pen's going to run out of ink, man. We can, we have it recorded. Yeah. So I got yeah. one more. Let's do let's do two more quick questions. Okay, can you just briefly describe what fermenting does to carbohydrates? Yeah. So fermenting reduces the carbohydrates. So when you reduce the carbohydrates, they're consumed by the bacteria, eliminating the carbohydrates, allowing them to be in a lower carbohydrate form. You know, to the extent that you allow the fermentation to process go on. And this is the problem with kombucha in the stores. They don't ferment it long enough, so it's sweet. And the reason it's sweet is because they sell that stuff to make profit, not to make you healthier. GT's kombucha, that big kombucha selling thing, you know, they, they don't, you know, advertise they're going to make you healthy. Uh, you know, they, they derive some benefits, you know, talking about kombucha's, you know, health benefits, but they leave too much carbohydrates in there. So that's, that's the really important process behind fermentation is, it, is the reduction of carbohydrates. And uh, then the the bacteria reproduce in larger numbers. So uh, that's that's what's happening in a simple reaction of uh, what called reduction chemical reaction uh, to eliminate those carbohydrates, making them a better f- source of food to consume. Right, they become a fiber, if I'm not mistaken, and basically uh, the microbiome feasts, but we don't. Right, we don't. And, and kimchi is is that that's always fermented, right? They wouldn't be pickled; they would be fermented generally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I don't know that it says on the labels actually if people are, are interested in that. Yeah, well, the way you know is it it's in, it's refrigerated. If you see anything on a shelf, that's not fermented. It's it may have been fermented at one time, and then they preserve it with chemicals or preservatives or or you know some something you know that. But you you want to buy it in a and the other thing is those things have living microbes. So reach in the back of the store when you buy your apple cider vinegar. Don't buy the glasses up front. The light kills those microbes. Nobody's tracking that, but reach in the very back of that shelf and get those microbes that are richer that are in the dark space because, and don't leave your apples, your probiotic apple cider vinegar out in the light because it's going to degrade them as well. It's a, it's a fascinating world. Fermentation takes place where it's dark and quiet 
And so, you know, you should leave your leave those for a minute. Apple cider vinegar can can, <clears throat> can stay because it's all reduced. <clears throat> it can stay in a uh, in a dark cupboard, but your fermented <clears throat> excuse me, your fermented vegetables have to be kept in a refrigerated uh, refrigerator so that they don't continue to ferment. Otherwise, they get really mushy. They're 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 safe to eat, but they just won't. Uh, they won't have the crunch and and some of the other textures that, that people want them to have. We'll do one last question, then we'll call it a day. Um, so, what, what's your uh, take on having a variety on a low carb diet? I mean, is there you know are you getting more nutrients or are you phytonutrients or do you believe in the you know antioxidants or you know what what do you eat? Let's put it that way. What does your typical meal look like? So I actually have a lot of variety, but it's, it, you know, I have a lot of variety of meat. And then the only vegetables I eat, the only ones that I permit in my body are ones that have been fermented. So um, that allows me a tremendous amount of diversity. So I, I take vegetables, I ferment them myself. And in some cases, I buy them. You know, I go, I shop around. If I see a different brand of fermented vegetables, I'll try them out. But I'm not eating a huge volume of them. I'm just eating them for their microbial benefits. So I just consume small amounts and I never eat meat. I never have a meal without having some fermentation with it. So I have blue cheese, I have fermented kimchi, variety of different kimchi, variety of different sauerkrauts, uh, a variety of, of, of different uh, yogurts. And uh, so I, I, I have a, a tremendous amount of diversity. And uh, I even, you know, there's studies that show that kimchi you know, actually improves, eradicates streptococcus mutans, the pathogenic microbe responsible for dental caries. You know, so I will put, after I brush my, my teeth, I will put a small amount of, of uh, kimchi juice in my mouth to get those microbes in there uh, to help optimize those nitric oxide producing microbes in your mouth, get rid of the strep mutans and uh, get better nitric oxide production as well. Brian, you gonna buy his toothpaste? <laughs> <laughs> I might, the lady behind me may not be so into that, but we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. I might do it, man. I Listen, mean, I'm, I'm seriously um, gonna get, I love kimchi anyways. The only problem I with it is it. if I open I it up, it. my whole family's like, what What happened in here? It's like disaster. <laughs> I'm like, it's good though, I like it. And I these old it. dudes know what they were talking about. I'm telling you, these guys aren't dumb. They, I mean, look at that, with gut health. A lot of people I've seen gut health get better on kimchi. There's no doubt about it. And, and it seems like it would be irritating and and because it's spicy a lot of times, but yeah, it really helps people. It's good. And I'm German. So the, the sauerkraut is always a good deal, right? So yeah, I think that, that those are great advice. That's something I I don't, I haven't been doing with my diet. So, you know, Troy, we get a free console here today. This is awesome I know, stuff. I know. Listen, but, this is great. Yeah. You know, but hearing from a pioneer, but he doesn't look like a pioneer. This guy is fit and in shape and, uh, you know, it's trying to forgive him for only working out a couple hours a week or a couple minutes a week or whatever. That's kind I of know, frustrating. man, I'm but, jealous. That's, the, that's, but the that's pretty awesome. It but out, you know, it know. shows what you're doing is working. You don't have to go work out seven hours a day. Like people think they have to. And I think that's a huge point. And, and really, I think the biggest contribution I think is, is this whole visceral fat and muscle mass. I think this is something that is, you're a pioneer in this area. And when I was seeing this, I was frustrated because I'm like, why are my patients not losing weight sometimes? Like the more visceral fat, the less weight they lost, but they were losing the inches. So when we understand what's happening on now, we could be better doctors and help our patients go, look, your BMI, you're getting stronger. You put on 12 pounds of muscle and you lose eight pounds of fat, right? You gain four pounds, be happy about it. And as a matter of fact, the, the converse, I have a guy, I looked at his labs before he came in and he's like, look, doc, I've lost weight. He's all excited. 3.6 pounds on, over the holidays. And I'm looking at his labs. I go, you're not working out anymore, are you? Right? He lost muscle mass and he and his numbers went terrible. Wow. Like, yeah, yeah. I got to get back to the gym. They closed my gym down. So I haven't been working out. So, you know, and, and I have other people that work out really hard and they come in, they gain three pounds. I'm like, congratulations. Look at that. You put on muscle mass, your visceral fat's going down, your weight's down, your waist is down two inches and you gain three pounds. We'll take it. Yeah. Right. So I think that marker that everyone, and I'm telling you, Troy, a lot of these studies, when we go back and look at them and they go, oh, look, there's no benefit of weight loss of keto versus other or low carb versus other. Let's look at muscle mass and see what's happening with that lean muscle mass. And I think a lot of those studies are missing out on that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. We didn't get into sarcopenia, but that's such a, a scourge right now in our country, sarcopenia for particularly, uh, you know, gentlemen and, and men and women are 50s and 60s, sarcopenia really picks up. But, but, you know, the MRI gives us the ability to do that. And just, 
you know, tone of, of musculature on the body. If you pay attention to your patients when you do an exam, you'll see, you know, nice tone and musculature in people that are healthy, preserving uh, that muscle mass and, and sarcopenia really needs to be addressed in its relationship to visceral fat. I have, I have a couple of videos on sarcopenia and visceral fat together as topics on my YouTube channel that uh, if anybody's interested, but yeah, sarco sarcopenia is a yeah, huge we'll link area. to that. We'll link to that yeah, for sure. How can people, yeah, I mean, can you, besides YouTube, how can people reach you if they want to, you know, reach out to you, find out more? Yeah. So I'm, I'm on uh, both Instagram and Twitter at Dr. Onomare, E-R-S-E-A-N-O-M-A-R-A, -E both on Twitter and Instagram and uh, on YouTube, just under Dr period, Sean O'Mara. And I think they use an apostrophe in that YouTube, O apostrophe M-A-R-A, -A. but I'm the only Dr. Sean O'Mara, at least so far on, on YouTube. And, uh, you know, I don't have great video production because I'm a not-for-profit. I'm, I'm in here and that's part of my problem. I got to figure out how to make profit, but I'm not for profit. And so I, I'm a one-man band and I don't have great video production, but I have interesting content and important content. And I hope to get better. You know, if I get some, you know, maybe some donor, if I figure out Patreon and maybe some donors will come in and help me improve the quality of my videos and do some great podcasting like you guys are doing. Uh, it's really, you know, uh, you guys are doing a fantastic job bringing this content and, and uh, your practices to helping patients on an individual level. And we just need to dialogue and promote this more so that people uh, can find out about alternatives to uh, taking medicines and just having surgical procedures all the time. Amen. Amen for me too, man. I mean, I greatly enjoyed it. I was really looking forward to this. And I, I know this is very valuable for people to listen to. I think it's going to change a lot of perspectives on things. And people who are frustrated, who think they're plateaued, if they measure their waist and it's coming down, who cares? Don't worry about it, right? Put muscle mass on. Sarcopenia is a huge topic. And we can spend an hour just talking about that, you know, lack of muscle. So this is what we're, we're talking about. This is kind of exciting because now we can tell people, look, here's what, what our goals are. Let's not worry about the weight so much. Let's look at metabolic health. And I think with COVID, it's it's really ripped the scab off so we can look you know, at the wound because this is the reality we're facing. We want people to be as metabolically healthy as possible. The weight is secondary. There's, there's people who are overweight that are healthy and there's people that are really skinny that are sick. That's the reality. We see it clinically. And, we, and so that's why you're contribution to medicine is so critical to look inside, <laughs> look under the hood and see what's un not, you know, you have a nice paint job, but there may be some damage in the engine compartment. So have a mechanic, check it out and make sure everything's good before you buy the car. <laughs> exactly right. But well, I appreciate the time that you guys <clears throat> have uh, allowed me to come on your show and talk about these important things. And I hope that the audience is uh, intrigued about MRIs and, and looking at, uh, key biological indicators and, and tracking the right things. And I hope both of you take a look at seeing that maybe you could find a diagnostic center that you could send your patients to uh, that can do affordable MRIs and not terribly expensive, maybe, you know, through your uh, 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 direct uh, DPC model to, to provide care. You can get, you know, leverage some good diagnostic studies. MRI is really the, the way to go, I think, because it gets better image. And uh, I look forward to hearing how that's working out for you and collaborating again in this really important space. No, oh, yeah, we will. We will for sure. Absolutely. We're going to be calling you for advice because I, I love what you're doing too. And who knows, we all may be working together someday because I think we have the same vision. Oh, we do. Yeah. I've really enjoyed our discussion and I'd be glad to come back in your podcast and collaborate anyway. And, and uh, Dr. Tro, I wish you all the best in your important discussion with uh, BioLane. I think that's going to be really interesting. And I, Hope it, I hope it goes really well. I'm sure it will. The last time it went uh, pretty well, but I think really um, it's one listening to people that don't think exactly the same way and, and kind of exploring that. And then the other thing will be, um, you know, figuring out what we don't agree on, you know, I think focusing what on what we that, do agree on and what we do yeah. agree on too. I think that's yeah. important because I think we're, we're going to agree on the sarcopenia problem for sure. And then we have to look at how we, how we best take care of patients. That's what, we, what we're looking at. And we, I think we have a lot of numbers and I think when you see the numbers, it, it's convincing. That's why, you know, the data speaks for sure. So, Hey, thanks guys. Uh, this Thank guy, you, Professor for... Noakes wants to talk to me about something. I don't know. I'll, I'm going to go <laughs> talk to him. So everyone have a great day. All right. Okay. Guys. All right. We'll have see a good you guys one. Take care. Time. All. Thank you. Patreon supporters.